Okay, here we go with January 2013 of Physics Unit 1 um, from Edexcel. This is an AS paper. Let's get started. Okay, question 1. An object of weight 7 newtons is raised from a height of 2 meters to a height of 8 meters. The change in gravitational potential energy is one of these answers. Okay, so firstly, mg here is 7 newtons and delta H is 8 minus 2, which is 6 meters. Okay, so we've got a 7 newton force being moved through a distance of 6 meters. So gravitational potential energy is mg times delta H, which is going to be 7 times 6, which gives us 42 joules. And consequently, that means that the answer here is A. Question 2, which of the following is a derived SI unit? Okay, so we've got the joule, the meter, power and time. Well, the joule is the energy unit, and it is derived because work is force times displacement, which is mass times acceleration times displacement. Meter is uh, the distance unit in the SI system. Power is the rate of working, but power, the word, is not a unit of anything. And time, the word, is not a unit of anything. So we've got a choice between A and B, and B is definitely uh, an SI base unit, so the derived unit here is the joule. Answer A. Question 3. A student is asked to solve the following problem. An object is thrown upwards with a speed of 25 meters per second. How high will it be when the speed is 12 meters per second? And which equation here will allow the problem to be solved in a single calculation? Okay, so let's just draw out what's happening. We know certain things about this. So we have a value for u. Uh, we have a value for v. These are both given. We know a because of gravity gives us our value for a. And we know, or we're interested in s. Okay. And obviously if we were actually solving this, we would be mindful of the fact that s could have a value on the way up and a value on the way down. But really, we're going to be looking for an equation that, um, because t is an unknown, doesn't involve t, but involves these other things which we either know or are interested in. So we've got our one unknown of s, and we've got u, v, and a, but we want to avoid t. So we need an equation that contains s, but doesn't require us to know t. And if we look at our selection there, we're basically eliminating any equation that has t in it. And the only one that contains the values that we're interested in, but avoids t, is d. Okay. Question 4. When beer is being brewed, it can contain bubbles of gas rising through it, as well as solid particles, such as grain particles, falling through it. Which row of the table correctly shows the forces on rising gas bubbles and falling solid object. Okay, so gas bubbles are on their way up, um, solid objects are on their way down, and we remind ourselves the most obvious thing is that the viscous drag, which is represented in our problems by F here, is always going to be opposing the motion. Okay? So if the bubble is rising, we should find that F is pointing down. So the bubbles are all rising. So we're looking for conditions where F is pointing down. The solids are all falling. So in those conditions, we would expect F to be pointing up. So while we have up thrust acting in the correct direction and weight acting in the correct direction, we can eliminate A because the drag forces don't act in the correct direction. So in general terms, what we're looking for is both up thrusts acting in the upward direction, both of the weights acting in the downward direction, the rising bubble will have a downward value of f and the falling solid will have an upward value of f. Okay, and that's what happens in B. Both the up thrusts are up, both the weights are down, the rising bubble has a drag pointing against its motion, the falling solid particle has a drag pointing against its motion, so this is this, the example that is correct. Now we can look at the others just out of interest and we'll see that the others again have mistakes in them. 
the drag forces are in the same direction here, so that can't be right. It's incorrect here. And this one has a drag that's incorrect here. Okay? So our answer then must be the set belonging to B. Question 5. A cylinder of length 50 centimeters has a force applied to it, and the new length of the cylinder is 45 centimeters. So this is what we're looking at here. Originally it was long. After the force was applied it got shorter. So this is clearly a compression that's going on. Okay. And uh, it says the quantity determined using 5 centimeters over 50, which is, if you look carefully, that's going to be the delta L, because this changes by 5, over the original length, L here. Okay. So delta L over L is strain. So this is a strain. And what we can do then is look at the options and say, well, we've got stresses and strains. So we can immediately ignore the two that are stresses, because this isn't a stress. Stress, remember, is force over area. So it's not stress. So we can ignore B and D. It's strain we're looking for. And only one of these is a compressive strain. Both of them are, both of them are a strain, but only one is a compressive strain. So it's A we're looking for. Okay, so the correct answer here is A. Question 6 then. An object is thrown horizontally from the roof of a building. Which pair of displacement time graphs correctly shows the vertical and horizontal components of displacement for the object until it lands? Assume there is no air resistance. So the first thing to remind ourselves of the fact that in the vertical there's an acceleration and in the horizontal there isn't. So in the horizontal direction, we would expect it to be covering equal displacements in equal times. So we would expect the graph in the horizontal to be a straight line increasing. Now in the first case, that is what it is. We've got a straight line increasing for the horizontal. However, we expect a curve on the other one because the displacement will be more each second. So we would expect this to curve up. Okay? And it's not doing that, so A is of no use to us. Let's have a look at B. Well, B, neither of them is doing what we want. This isn't increasing linearly, and this isn't curving up. So they're both not what we're looking for. Okay. These um, are the droids that we're looking for. So we've got the curve up as expected for um, the accelerating part, and the straight line that we expect from the steady speed part and if we just take a look at D um, we've got the curve but we don't have the straight line part over here so the answer is going to be C that's the pair of graphs that are doing what we want them to do Question 7. Three springs X, Y and Z have forces applied to them. For each spring a graph is plotted of length L of the spring against force F the graphs are shown below. Okay, so we have here um, in the first one the length L getting smaller. So this is some kind of uh, linear behavior and it's being compressed. So we can call that like linear compression. So because it is linear, we can say that it does seem to be obeying Hooke's law. Um, the next one is linear stretching. And again, nice straight line. So this is what happens when you stretch a spring. Its length gets longer and it follows a straight line. The third one is a stretching, but it's a non-linear, and some materials do this, but they're not obeying Hooke's law. So we've got linear, linear, and not linear. So this is true, this is true, and this isn't true. So we're looking for an option that gives us X and Y as the options. Okay, so, oops, sorry, so the answer here is A. Question 8, a car of mass 1400 kilograms is travelling at 25 meters per second. The kinetic energy of the car is one of these figures. Well, we have an expression for kinetic energy, it's a half times the mass times the velocity squared, and if we put in some numbers, it's a half times 1400 times 25 squared, and when we do that, we get 437500 joules. Okay. 
uh, which would be 430 at approximately kilojoules, which is answer C. Question 9. An airplane is flying horizontally and heading north through the air. Its speed through the air is A, and the wind is blowing east with a speed B. So one of these expressions is the speed over the ground. Okay. So we've got the airplane moving north through the air while the air moves sideways. Okay. So these vectors are going to combine to produce some diagonal motion over the land. And that's what we have to establish. So what we've got then is a triangle with A being added tip to tail with B and that will give us a resultant of those two motions being added together. And then we look at these options that they've given us and what we've got here for the size of the speed by adding these two vectors is that R here from Pythagoras will be the root of A squared plus B squared okay and so we've really solved our problem there there's only one of those answers that relates to that correctly and it's D so we're asked a question about the same problem in number 10 um, specifically they want to know the angle from the north at which the plane is flying over the ground and so I've added an angle here theta that is um, to the north to work out what angle this resultant is at. Now, um, this angle relates to A and B through the tan. The tangent of theta will be the opposite, the line opposite to theta, over the adjacent, the line adjacent to theta. So the tan of theta is going to be B over A. So theta is going to be the inverse tan, or tan to the minus 1, of B over A. Okay, and that means that we're talking answer D again.